programme in case there's any sort of, there are some bit late breaking sessions being added. We're expecting this session to last for about two hours. So there'll be 10 minutes for each present presenter, followed by a few minutes for questions. Um, I will be posting a link in the chat to um, vote on all the presentations. So I'll put that in the, in the chat shortly. Any issues with technology, uh, you can email much at manchester.ac.uk. Uh, just to let you know, this session is being recorded. So I'll just stop sharing my screen now. And then we've got got um Nia first up. Are you ready, Nia, with your presentation? Yeah, I'll just share my screen. Uh, so this is um, Nia Coop from Lancaster University. Sorry, I think the uh, heat's affecting my laptop a little bit. <laughs> okay, can you see that again? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Yakub. I'm from uh, Lancaster University. I'm working with um, Jen Logue, who's also at, at Lancaster, and Ifor Manaya, who is at Halton Borough Council. And I'm going to be talking about um, our approach to increasing local authority research capacity in Chester and Merseyside. So, um, a little bit of background. A lot of these things have been covered in, in a lot more detail over the festival, so I'm sure you've all heard all, all these things before. Um, but just a quick bit of a background. So widening health inequalities suggests there's a real need to shift the balance from uh, our current approach to acute treatment of illness to, to prevention, and particularly targeting those who need it the most. Um, for those of you outside of, of England or outside of the UK might not know, so public health here is based um, within local authorities, so within the local government, and it has been since 2013. So they're really well placed to tackle these wider determinants of health within their, within their um, areas. The work of public health is also research informed, but local authorities or the sort of local government staff aren't necessarily research active themselves, so they're not always um, doing any active research, rather than they're using research that's already published. So last year, the NIHR, so that's the National Institute for Health Research, have a public health research programme, and they funded projects across 14 sites in the UK to have a look at it, to realise the importance of local authority research, and they wanted to find out what were the main barriers to, to them becoming more research active. And off the back of this, they funded some research practitioner roles, so I'm one of these, um, working part-time on this, uh, to support the implementation of these findings within local authorities across the UK. So I'm just going to give a little bit of context about Cheshire and Merseyside. Again, if you're outside of England or the UK, you might not be familiar. So Cheshire and Merseyside is um, here on the map in the bottom right in the northwest of England. It consists of nine local authorities and um, sort of serves a population of 2.2 million and also is home to four universities. And uh, Cheshire and Merseyside's Health and Care Partnership is the second largest of, of those in NHS England and they will be um, as part of this sort of integrated integrated care that's been talked about again in the festival, this is going to happen here with by April 2022. We also quite lucky in Cheshire Mother's Side, we have CHAMPS, which is a public health collaborative. So um, it's an existing network of nine directors of public health across Cheshire Mother's Side from those local authorities on the previous slide. And they have a quite a collaborative approach to improving the public health priorities specifically in these areas. There's also um, Cypher, I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced actually, bringing together linked data and a pool of analysts across Cheshire and Merseyside, delivering a programme of responsive applied public health research and they are um, doing a, a mul multiple evaluative projects. So this context has really given you an idea of the sort of foundation that we're working with is, you know, obviously a lot of things that we can tap into here in terms of increasing the research capacity. So like I said, the, the overall aim is to increase the research capacity in these local authorities. Um, Cheshire and Merseyside wasn't one of the original sort of pilot, site, pilot sites or, uh, that the NHL funded of those 14 that I mentioned. Um, so what we're really interested in doing is making sure that all, there, there were a range of barriers that were obviously um, sort of transferable across areas that came up in a lot of the reports. We want to make sure they're really tailored to, the, to our context. So the first step, um, the, the approach we've gone for is using the COMBI model. Again, this has been talked about in the, in the conference already, but for those of you who um, are not familiar, 
The combi model um, suggests that we need capability, opportunity and motivation in order for a behaviour to occur. So that includes um, psychological and physical capability. So that's all the, the knowledge and skills are required to engage in the behaviour. So the behaviour being um, doing research. There's physical and social opportunities. So these are all the outside factors which make the behaviour possible. And then the motivation. So this is all these sort of internal brain processes which direct our decisions and behaviours. So the idea is to um, map on the previous findings onto these to sort of really identify what, needs to, what we need to focus on to, to move forward and, and increase this research. So, uh, so far we've looked at reports from seven areas and um, before I go into the COMBI model findings, just to mention that the, they mostly identify their barriers, not just to doing research, but also using research. So we've got all these um, factors in regards to doing research and then using research as well. And I'll, I'm going to discuss these in relation to the COMBI model. Also, just to mention, because these reports aren't yet publicly available, I've just noted the number of reports that we've identified these barriers within. So that's what the number in, in the brackets are. So with regards to capability, um, there's barriers in terms of, as you might imagine, a lack of expertise because they're not sort of research experts in the local authority, so a lack of research knowledge. Um, so that applied both to doing the research and also in terms of research literacy and being able to understand existing research and putting that into practice. And linking into that is also sort of research skills and lack of research training within local authorities. There's also a range of barriers um, in relation to opportunity. So um, physical opportunity, the thing that comes up time and time again in any of these kind of implementing a new way of working is um, time and money, basically. So time both to do the research and apply for the funding and also the funding actually um, accessing the funding and having that money to pay for the research and to pay additional costs like um, paying public contributors, for example. And then in terms of using the research, also sort of physical barriers to ac accessing research findings and, you know, coming up against paywalls, not having that link with the university to be able to um, access journals. And I, I guess, and related to that, there's a real lack of infrastructure within local authorities to support the research. So things like governance and ethics, they're currently having to rely on having relationships with universities to access their, um, you know, to gain ethical approval for their research. And whilst there, is, there are sort of pockets of this going on, it's not a consistent thing. There's no kind of a consistent infrastructure to support that. So that also links to the fact that research is often university led and people within, within universities don't always, they're not always familiar with um, the way local authorities work and their structures. And also across a lot of the sites, communication barriers between local authority and higher education institutions. institutions. So people working with local authorities and um, academics, again, there's sort of pockets of this where there's some relationships going on, but no kind of um, anything set up to, to facilitate those communication routes. And then also social opportunities. So a lack of research culture in local authority. It's not a kind of expected part of their work. And again, something that comes up a lot when um, academics are working with anyone outside and organisations outside of universities is this tension between the academic rigour and the amount of time it takes to do research um, and that clash with the timely results that are required in local authority. And I guess that's something that's um, been really important during this past year and a half of, of COVID. And I think people have responded really well to be able to meet, meet those fast demands. And there's also the motivation. So um, research is not embedded in the usual work. It's very kind of ad hoc. But what's really promising is that there was appetite for research in most areas. So despite all these barriers, there's a real, um, uh, a lot of the staff in local authorities are very keen to do research. It's just that they find that they don't, all these barriers are in the way. And then reflective motivation. So again, linking into the fact that it's not unexpected, it's not kind of within the research culture. It's also not, there's no career option with a local, within local authorities. So there's no real motivation to go above and beyond you full daytime work to do this additional research when it's not going to benefit your career. A lack of confidence. Um, some local authority staff felt that, um, you know, research is something that happens in, in universities by professors and it's not something that they do, even though it's quite similar to a lot of the kind of evaluation work that they're already doing. And also in terms of using research as a value on local data. So, you know, people, for example, in the Northwest might not think that something, something published in London, for example, or somewhere else in the UK isn't going to be relevant. So they might sort of dismiss that. But there's also an opportunity to tap into that and, and show the kind of um, 
the value and the benefit of being able to do research within your own area. So thinking about how these are going to be addressed, like I say, I'm working with uh, Dr. Former Anaya, who's a public health consultant in um, Halton Council, and um, she's only four hours a week and I'm part time initially for a year. So we're trying to think, what, what can we achieve in that time? And we've the two main things are training. So this would really um, focus on the issues that I identify in terms of psychological capability. So the knowledge and, and the skills around uh, research training to address the lack of expertise, knowledge, confidence and research literacy. And also some of the things could be addressed around opportunity. So things like reframing their idea of the fact that, you know, obviously there are time, there's only so much they can do with their time, but kind of reframing that lack of time and the fact that they are already doing research to some extent. And it's just what tweaks can be made to make that sort of the quick evaluation that they are doing into, into a research. And then the other main thing we're looking at is a research hub. So something similar has been done in Yorkshire and Humber. Um, and it's just a way to enhance that uh, communication between local authorities and higher education institutions through a, a central point, having that sort of structure set up. Like I said, we're really lucky in Cheshire Merseyside that we have champs. So um, that's going to be our, our central point for this. And as part of that, we're hoping to identify research champions within the local authorities and as well as have a list of academic links so we can link them in and provide those research champions with honorary research contracts so they can access journals, for example. We're going to do this through a series of workshops. Um, we want to make sure the hub is actually wanted and needed. We do already have support of a lot of local academics in the universities I mentioned, as well as CHAMP, so there's a really good start and there does seem to be a real appetite for it. But we just want to make sure that we identify the kind of main purpose, what they want out of it, and whether that differs from what we think is going to be the purpose of it. We're also going to include some discussions to identify the main barriers to research. So the ones that I've already it's more about confirming those barriers, you know, are they relevant to Cheshire and Merseyside, as well as identifying if there's any um, particular barri barriers within the context of Cheshire and Merseyside that haven't been identified, as well as identifying training needs and um, sort of ongoing issues around um, identifying public health priorities. So finally, there's a, there's a more that needs to be done outside of what we can achieve, but the NHR are addressing these with a whole host of um, increased number of fellowships and uh, research um, money available to public health research but there are again further long-term issues that need addressing in terms of governance further barriers for third sector um, accessibility of research findings and the sustainability of research thank you thanks nia that was a, a brilliant presentation thank you so much for that and um, we've just got a uh, couple of questions. Um, the first one is, uh, thank you Nia, that was very interesting. Did you speak to any uh, local authority chief executives and do they support spending their very limited resources on their staff spending time on your research? That's a really interesting, important question I think. Um, yeah, I've not, as I say, this is just um, summarising and synthesising all the evidence that's out there already. Um, I'd have to go back and double check exactly who, who they spoke to. I know it was a, a, within, the, within each report, they spoke to a range of local authority staff, and I'm not totally clear about whether they spoke to chief executives. What I do know is from the, the directors of public health that we've spoken to in our area, they are really keen um, for us to go ahead with this and, and increase that. And I think with the, I think, one of the main things they've talked about is the fact that they could this kind of increased skills and time to research if they'd have had that at the beginning of covid it would have helped um in a, in a whole host of ways i guess uh, over this last year and a half so they're very keen to kind of implement that going forward Thank you. And um, we've had another question. Do you find there's a certain breakthrough point between local authorities and universities, which allows the local authorities to be more research active? Uh, I've been to me many meetings, says Greg, between the university and LAs in the past, and often there is enthusiasm, but it doesn't progress. How do you think we can get beyond this point more easily? Well, I think that's partly what we're hoping with the research hub is that as well as having this central point that people can contact, because I've, I've done also work in a local authority and you kind of, there's lots, like I say, there's lots of pockets and people will do a small research project and then it kind of fizzles out. 
Um, what we're hoping is with the research hub is that we'll have um, regular meetings. We can hopefully, if everyone has a list of um, contact points as well as research areas, expertise, public health priorities, um, is that there's this kind of continuous way that people can connect, identify what, what research needs to be done, what funding is available, and that, that will hopefully drive it forwards in a more sort of sustainable way. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Nia. That's um, a really, really excellent presentation. Um, can I just double check that Oliver's with us? Hi, yep, I'm here. Hi, Oliver. Brilliant. I'm just going to check that I've made you co-host. There is so someone before me, though, is there not? Caroline. Uh, Caroline's not here oh, today, okay. uh, right. but thank you very much for, for being so polite. Um, I'll just double check that I've made you a co-host. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Over to you, Oliver. Thank you. Thank you. And make sure everyone's seeing the right slide. Yeah. So, um, good afternoon, uh, uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are today watching. Um, my name is Oliver Trainer. I'm a PhD student at the University of Glasgow, and I'm going to present some work I've been doing titled "Developing a Program Theory of Nature-Based Early Learning and Child Care for Child Health and Wellbeing." which I'll refer to as ELC. Um, ELC encompasses all forms of early childhood education for three to five-year-olds in the UK, often referred to in international literature as early childhood education or early childhood education and care. Nature-based ELC may also be referred to as forest kindergartens, fearless live in Scandinavian countries, or bush kindergartens in Australia. So a little bit of context. Um, some uh, significant investment has been made by the Scottish government in providing outdoor play and learning opportunities, not least of which is the doubling of free childcare provision and the development of several guidance policies. Uh, Scotland was also the first country in the UK to enshrine children's right to play outdoors and its national health and social care standards underlining the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, also, given the wide variation in settings that offer nature-based play and learning, uh, there remains a lack of understanding of how nature-based play and learning is expected to function across ELC settings and impact child health and wellbeing outcomes. So there's been a number of systematic reviews in this field, and most have concluded that much of the research suffers from poor methodological designs, such as small sample sizes, cross-sectional studies, or poor recognition of confounding variables, therefore making results hard to interpret. Additionally, the evidence base is currently unable to support ongoing policy decisions in, in this field, especially related to explicit recommendations such as those you can see in the third bullet point here. Um, many of these issues can start to be addressed by taking a step back in the design of evaluation studies and investing a small amount of resources in developing a well-designed program theory. Program theory is an explicit model of how um, an intervention program or policy functions and achieves its goals firstly through short and intermediate outcomes and then intended long outcomes. A lack of program theory not only has implications for future evaluation design, but also the implementation of programs across settings. So this is just a standard simple representation of how a program theory could be visually represented uh, in the form of a logic model. Um, having an explicit program theory can support the provision of any program or intervention by detailing the processes, mechanisms, and circumstances uh, required to achieve change in target outcomes. So I'll argue here that by designing a rigorous program theory, researchers, practitioners, and evaluators can evaluate programs of stronger methodological quality and produce reliable results. Therefore, um, the aim of this study was to demonstrate the value of developing a program theory 
of nature-based ELC using secondary data analysis. Now, the key messages I hope you'll take away from this presentation uh, are here. Um, this not only has implications for future evaluations and study designs, but it should also show why we shouldn't shy away from using secondary data sources. And in fact, they should be used as a starting point in research, uh, which can be sense checked in the current context. Uh, moreover, a well-designed program theory has implications for future evaluations, study designs, and stakeholder collaboration. So this piece, I used a triangulation methodology of three um, secondary data sources, um, the interview and focus group um, data and observation schedules um, originate from the same study, which was carried out pre-COVID. And the majority of these um, settings and the observations were satellite models. Um, the empirical studies were identified from a systematic review um, of on nature-based ELC and child health and wellbeing outcomes. The studies identified for use in this study used quantitative or mixed methods methodology to investigate the impact of nature-based childcare on child health and wellbeing outcomes. Now, the benefit of data triangulation is that it allows in investigators to detect where results from each data source uh, converge and agree, but also shed light on findings that might not be so clear in one source, but evident in the other or any disagreements that need further exploration. So the data sources were analyzed using framework method analysis based on a coding framework developed around a logic model design. These contain the categories inputs, activities, outcomes, and contextual factors. And this slide just shows what data sources addressed uh, which aspects of the logic model design. So this is an example of a framework matrix for the, from the transcript analysis, looking specifically at uh, activities of nature-based ELC. I triangulated this matrix with the framework matrix of the observation schedules um, and identified where there were any agreements or disagreements. For the empirical data, all outcomes that were investigated were listed in a framework type table and cross-referenced uh, with what was reported in the transcript analysis. For example, there was dissonance among empirical studies as to whether children were mostly sedentary or physically active while outdoors. However, when triangulating this data with the qualitative data, uh, it demonstrated that in this context, um, i.e. where the observations took place in Glasgow, children were active most of the time while outdoors. Additionally, Dissonance was identified between the transcripts and empirical data um, among the rates of illness. Some of the empirical data reported that children in nature-based ELC had a higher rate of sickness absenteeism. However, the parents mentioned in the transcripts that they observed no increased rates of illness when their children spent more time outdoors in nature. And in fact, some believed that their children were ill less frequently. Um, Two minutes remaining. Uh, so this is a logic model, uh, the output of from the secondary data analysis. And if we just take an extract of that, we can see that um, a number of locations and affordances which lead to some activities such as play and nature experiences, then leads to a number of measurable outputs and some short term outcomes. Um, we then developed this logic model further during workshops with practitioners across Scotland. Uh, this sense checked the logic model to the current context, i.e. during COVID, as these workshops took place um, via Zoom. Um, and if we take another excerpt out of that, we can see there's been an addition of locations and affordances, which also led to um, play and nature experiences, rather than being two distinct activities, which you saw in the previous logic model, um, it was understood that in reality, all activities children engage in are through play. So I've made an attempt to express that here, which then led to a series of outputs and additional outcomes. Uh, the logic model was further refined during an outcome prioritization exercise, um, which refined the outcomes, but you also might 
consider for it to be a true logic model, then there should be connections between activities, outputs, and direct to specific outcomes. And you're right, and this is a process that's currently underway, which I'm doing with um, practitioners in the Glasgow area through a series of additional workshops. So future implications for this research, um, program theory of nature-based ELC is intended to support the implementation and future evaluation designs. Further stakeholder collaboration is required to elucidate the relationship between the activities, outputs and outcomes, which is ongoing. And before any future if, um, impact evaluation can be carried out, it's necessary to carry out a feasibility study and um, to look at key uncertainties. So I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you to my supervisors, uh, my co-authors and my funders. Um, are, are there any questions? Thank you, Oliver. That was really, really interesting. Um, I'm just waiting to see if there's any further questions, but I've got one. I'm just keen to know how you're going to be disseminating this both to um, stakeholders and, and also professionals. Uh, um, th thank you for your question. Um, well, this is an ongoing um, manuscript development I'm doing at the moment. So that's hopefully how it'll get published and that will be obviously for academics, but I'm also just finished a series um, an evaluability assessment, which is a series of workshops I've done with um, nursery practitioners in the Glasgow area, um, which I will be writing up in a um, evaluability assessment report, which will be sent directly to um, the stakeholders involved and anyone else um, in the early year sector or local authority to read as well, which will include um, the findings that I've discussed here. That's really interesting. I've, I've been reading a lot like recently about forest schools as well, and I, I just find this area really, really fascinating. And um, we, we have another question. Um, nice work, Oliver. I love the presentation. I, oh, it's more of a comment. I would love to see such a model being applied in an African context. Thank you for that. Um, Near asks, any findings on inequalities across different socioeconomic areas in accessing this type of play? Uh, that's, uh, that's a very good question, actually, and it's not something I've researched specifically, but it is something that's very much under consideration, especially in the Glasgow context. There are um, a number of programmes that are underway with um, early year settings, specifically in deprived areas. It's um, Glasgow do have some very seriously deprived areas that are programmed specific to getting young children in these areas out into nature and um, also headed by a um, third sector organisation called Inspiring Scotland. Um, so there is work ongoing there um, but in terms of research that's something hopefully it will be explored in uh, a feasibility study that I, that I hope to do soon <laughs> if I get it designed. <laughs> Lovely, and, and we'll be looking out for that. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Oliver. So um, our next speaker, I think, is with us. And this is Mohamed Mikhail, and he will be presenting on the administration of misoprostol as a promising, effective and cost efficient treatment for traumatic postpartum hemorrhage in rural and low resource settings. And it's a systematic review of randomized control trials. Do we have Mohammed with us? Yes, I'm here. Yes, hi, over Hello. to you, thank you. Okay, and I'll be presenting with my colleague here, Gary Solowan, so yeah. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, I'll try I'll start my presentation in three, two, and one. Good afternoon, good morning, and also good evening, respective attendees. So postpartum hemorrhage has been one of the leading cause of maternal mortality worldwide. But can you imagine the implication it has in limited resource settings? So in that regards, my name is Muhammad Mikhail Atiza Ashura, and today with my colleague, Gary Solowan, I'll be presenting our research entitled Administration of Misoprostol as a Promising Effective and Cost-Efficient Treatment for Traumatic Postpartum Hemorrhage in Rural and Low-Resource Settings. 
So first of all, we have no conflict of interest to declare. And here's the outline for our presentation. Now on to the introductions. All right, thank you, Atif, for the short opening. Uh, so first of all, I think it's important for us to discuss why uh, postpartum hemorrhage or PPH is still a very relevant issue. So first of all, PPH is uh, the most common cases of obstetric hemorrhage. And together with this, uh, there is still the lack of an efficient preventive method. Therefore, uh, we can see how maternal deaths from uh, PPH are very, very high. Furthermore, uh, epidemi epidemiological studies have found that how uh, the highest rate of maternal mortality due to PPH are actually located in rural areas, often uh, with inadequate healthcare facilities. And together with this current condition, we have to acknowledge that the golden standard for uh, prophylactic uh, for PPH prophylaxis is uh, parenteral oxytocin. However, it is still much uh, ineffective in its usage due to the unreliable healthcare uh, facilities to store as well as uh, unre unreliable uh, manpower to administer them. Uh, we do also have to acknowledge how oral misoprostol is an adequate substitute because of its uh, easy to be stored and it is also easy to be administered uh, via the oral route, which has which gives it the potential to replace parenteral oxytocin. Given this uh, current condition where maternal death uh, due to PBH are still very, very high in rural areas with uh, low resource healthcare facilities, uh, our systematic review of uh, RCTs aim to review and validate the efficacy of oral misoprostol uh, in an attempt to provide evidence-based information for the general public to aid in the future uh, management of PPH, which in the long run, we hope to be reducing the maternal mortality rates. Therefore, uh, the objectives of our paper will be first to validate the effect, analyze and validate the effectiveness of oral misoprostol as a PPH prophylaxis. Secondly, to assess how uh, how it is applicable and distributable in rural areas and also to evaluate how it could be utilized to supplement WHO strategies toward ending preventable maternal mor mortality, which altogether uh, would help re the realization of uh, sustainable development goals number 3.1. Okay, moving on. Okay, next to our methods. So this review was conducted based on the PRISMA guidelines with the following main keywords, and also the following inclusion and exclusion criteria based on the PCOS statement. On the right here, you can see the PRISMA flowchart in which we have 472 studies recorded from five different databases. And after exclusion from the authors, we have nine studies to be included within this review. So here are the data extracted. As you can see, there's author and year, study design, location, sample size and characteristics, intervention and method of delivery of the misoprostol, and finally the study outcomes in which, which are HP decline, PPH incidence, and also blood loss. Furthermore, the studies will then be analyzed and also critically appraised by two independent reviewers and adjudicated by the reviewer until consensus was met. So here are the results. So, and you, as you can see on the top left there, there's a QR code where you can scan for the full summary table of our systematic review. But in summary, we have nine RCTs with a total of 15,309 subjects. Here are the main findings for those studies. So, the studies were conducted in six countries, mainly in the African and South Asian region, and five of them administered orally, and four of them administered misoprostol sublingually. The dose used were around 600 to 800 micrograms with preoperative and spontaneous administration upon the identification of PPH. And finally, the most common adverse events reported include non lethal shivering, fever, and also diarrhea. Next, for a critical appraisal, we use Cochrane RLB2 and we converted the values into HRQ or the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality. And as you can see here, there are six good studies and three with poor quality. Why they are poor? This is due to the bias of deviations from internet interventions because within these three studies, the studies compared oxytocin with misoprostol, which is very, very different in terms of administration and hence masking was not being able to conduct it. All right, with the results that we discovered, uh, it is therefore important for us to first recognize the various risk factors that can trigger uh, postpartum hemorrhage. So these risk factors may come in the form of a chronically existing disease, for example, preeclampsia or anemia, and also may be due to uh, congenital uh, abnormalities uh, in the anatomy of the uterus, or even something that would uh, happen during the process of birth itself. With, uh, with these risk factors, uh, they may trigger the 4T that can cause uh, postpartum hemorrhage, which are the changes in tone, trauma, tissue, and thrombin of the uterus. Uh, with this uh, basic uh, physiological knowledge, uh, it is therefore uh, that it is therefore that um, 
TPH is still a very much relevant issue that is yet to be solved, as we can see from the uh, very, very high death rates. Furthermore, not only due, uh, not only due to the uh, complex uh, outcomes or the uh, complicated outcomes, the approach towards PPH currently is still very much etiology-based. Etiology uh, the approaches are still focused on surgical intervention, analgetic measures, and uh, the use of uh, uterotonics as well as uh, certain methods such as Johnson's method to treat any occurrence of uterine inversion, which altogether uh, are still very much likely to produce a higher risk of complications. Uh, and it at that state, uh, it may require uh, unfavorable procedures such as hysterectomy to correct the postpartum hemorrhage. Next, on to the efficacy of misoprostol. So for the dose indicator here, if you base on the incidence of PPH acquired, in general, there, there is a reduction in PPH incidence versus the placebo or control. Furthermore, to specify, in the et al. study, the significant results were identified with more of 50% reductions in comparison to the control. Although in the studies, other factors or multifactorial substance were, were identified that may affect these values. Next, there are HB decline and blood loss by these two studies, in which in Waterfront et al., significant reductions were also compared to agrimatine, which is a currently drug used for PPH as well. Although in Diop et al., the um, implementation of misoprostol was not statistically, statistically different with oxytocin. Although we have to compare it based on their applicability and also the cost effectiveness of misoprostol, hence making it far, far inferior compared to oxytocin. Carrying on, this is the applicability, and as I've mentioned before, these are the advantages of Mzaprostol. So if we base on the applicability again, a study by Raghavan and Unger et al. have been shown that if we implement and introduce Mzaprostol into the community, they have a very, very high willingness and also recommendation within their own secluded communities. Furthermore, a study by Sangfi et al. have been shown that the, upon the introduction of Mzaprostol, the communities have a 99.8% approval and very, very willing to spread it, more, spread it out within their own communities. Furthermore, in the same studies, they also evaluated the cost in which each uh, administration costs about 0 0.34 or $0.69 USD. Two minutes remaining. Okay, this is the safety. So these are the common findings for misoprostol usage, although it's, it's uh, been shown to be insignificant, and also misoprostol has been shown to have a superior safety profile as a secondary prophylaxis, meaning it's better to be uh, additional current treatment. Lastly, the side effects associated with associated poses less risk in comparison to oxytocin, hence making it a very, very superior treatment compared to the current treatment as well. All right, with the following results, and then we also like to discuss the current strengths and uh, limitations of our study. The current strengths of our study includes the large and diverse sample pool. All the results were extracted from RCTs, which are the golden standard of evidence-based medicine, and it also emphasizes on the results of One Health collaborations. However, we do recognize several weaknesses, such as uh, the inability to appropriately mask interventions for each patient due to differences in administration method of misoprostol and oxytocin, and there are differences in outcome indicators used by uh, several studies, as well as how there may be other confounding factors that uh, can influence the result. Overall, uh, misoprostol is a highly applicable uh, drug due to its ease of usage, effectively comparable to misoprostol, uh, to oxytocin, highly sustainable, and it is easy to store and altogether allows it to be an effective, safe, and cost-efficient treatment for traumatic PPH in low resource setting. Hopefully, its widespread usage will allow uh, misoprostol to gain uh, to achieve the succession of SDG goal number one and three, which is to abolish poverty and uh, to reduce maternal mortality. Based on our study, these are our recommendations regarding the results. Uh, first is to urge commitment from both local and international, international governments to support and aid the wide usage of misoprostol, uh, which includes reinforcing uh, misoprostol usage, uh, usage protocols to the spread of uh, evidence-based medicine. Uh, secondly, is to, uh, where needed, Sorry. collaborate with the local uh, student-led organization. Okay, I'll continue. Uh, to meet uh, certain unmet needs such as manpower. And also, all in all, it constitutes a complete horizontal and vertical approach towards uh, the issue of traumatic PPH uh, management in a low resource setting. And over here on the right, you can see our implementation model to ensure misoprostol introduction sustainability among low resource communities. And lastly, for the uh, academic society, we recommend that uh, larger and more variant studies are conducted on the efficacy of misoprostol and also to research to further research the extent of knowledge regarding misoprostol usage in rural communities to ensure its successful implementation. 
with that being said, uh, it is the end of our presentation. These are our references. And to close off, we would like to end it with a little message. Oral Misal Prostol for Healthy Mothers in Control. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really, really excellent presentation and really brilliant graphics as well. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a question. Um, I'm, I'm only going to go with the one question for now because we have gone a little bit over. Um, it's an awesome presentation. It has significant implications for the Global South. How will these findings be translated to practitioners? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Unit. So as you can see, uh, we, are, we are currently doing this study from a Global South perspective again. And how are we going this, how are these findings going to be translated into practitioners? practitioners? We think that first of all, we need to first of, uh, introduce this to the system initially, because for us in Indonesia, the current treatment for PPH or postpartum hemorrhage has not been misoprostol and is still being used as oxytocin. And hence, before we start to talk about practitioners, we can first talk about changing the system and also how are we going to change for example, the policies regarding what can be used and also the protocols used for PPH. And hence, after that has been changed, then maybe we could start implementing the use of misoprostol within these communities. And for practitioners aside, maybe because in Indonesia, uh, we tend to spread out our practitioners into, for example, more secluded areas to achieve UHC or universal, uh, universal health coverage. And by doing that, by introducing them to misoprostol, hence they're able to, for example, educate the communities and also maybe to um, implement the use of misoprostol within these communities. And by implementing and introducing them, the communities will be Become very very self-sufficient and self-sustainable and hence it'll be it'll, it'll continue to be sustainable and hopefully the usage of the prostol within these further communities will be easier and also more widespread so i think that's how we're going to implement the to the practitioners thank you thank you so much that's wonderful and um, can i just check that we have um anna raquel here for the next presentation please yes i'm here Hi. Hi. So um, over to you now and Anna's going to be presenting on the contribution of assets to adaptation to extreme temperatures among older adults. Thank you very much Elizabeth for the presentation. Uh, um, so my name is uh, Raquel Nooms. I am based uh, at the Warwick Medical School uh, at the University of Warwick. Uh, this study is part of a, a larger project looking at vulnerability, resilience and adaptation to extreme temperatures. Uh, but today I'll, I'll be presenting on the contribution of assets to adaptation. So a brief overview of, uh, of my presentation will, um, uh, it will entail um, a bit of a research context for why it is important uh, to do research in this topic, the research methods that have been used, uh, some of the findings, and also some conclusions. So in terms of um, uh, the research context, uh, climate change and extreme temperatures are posing increasing challenges to uh, individuals and their health. Um, especially in specific uh, groups of, of the population of which older adults are, are part. Uh, despite this, uh, the approach uh, I am taking here is that we, we shouldn't look at vulnerable groups as uh, um, one approach fits all and we should look at individual vulnerability instead. Uh, in this case, extreme temperatures, and uh, I looked at uh, uh, heat waves and, and cold weather, they impact on, on the ability of individuals to, to adapt, and different individuals will uh, adapt differently. Uh, these uh, adaptation strategies or behaviors that uh, individuals use um, are aimed at reducing both the direct and the indirect effects of extreme temperatures. And these can vary from uh, um, uh, effects uh, in terms of morbidity, but also in terms of mortality. We also found that more knowledge is needed on what are the determinants of adaptation, 
So what determines how uh, different uh, older adults adapt and what are the factors that influence uh, uh, these um, strategies to uh, adapt to extreme temperatures. And also that uh, uh, more research is, is needed to understand the way through which uh, individuals are able to reduce the impacts of extreme temperatures. In order to do all this, um, I've used uh, an assets-based approach uh, in a case study in Lisbon in Portugal. Uh, it was implemented through a uh, mixed methods research design, uh, through uh, surveys and interviews with older uh, adults. Uh, we took uh, an interseasonal approach. So for example, when uh, uh, addressing ex extreme heat or, or heat waves uh, adaptation strategies. We, we did the interviews and the surveys during the summer months when it's hotter so that individuals uh, could relate the answers uh, to, to our research uh, and the weather that they were experiencing um, at, the, at that time. Um, so it was done uh, in summer and, and winter. Um, the, the way it was done was to explore participants' assets and uh, the role assets play in uh, adap adaptation to extreme temperatures. When I, I talk about assets, I, I, I'm talking about five different types of assets. Human assets, such as level of education, uh, occupation, uh, marital status. Uh, when uh, talking about financial assets, we're talking about income or pensions or savings uh, individuals have. In terms of physical assets, we're looking at um, um, uh, housing type of house where individuals uh, live uh, housing tenure so if, if they're renting or if they they have ownership of uh, of the home um, also access to uh, heating devices or cooling devices um, when um, in relation to place-based assets we looked at um, at um, uh, both services that are available to individuals locally, so and how they access those services, for example, health care, um, cool places during the summer months, or uh, places where they can go access uh, when it's really cold. And in terms of social assets, uh, we looked at uh, social networks and uh, social contacts and also social participation. And then after uh, do all, all the interviews, we used the thematic analysis to uh, analyze the, uh, the data. So in terms of, of the, re uh, the results uh, of, uh, of the research, um, in terms of uh, the, the heat wave uh, adaptation findings and how assets uh, are linked and de determine how adaptation and how individuals um, cope and adapt to, to heat, we found that um, health beliefs and, and misconceptions uh, were some of the, the barriers for some individuals to, to be able to cope with, uh, with extreme heat. So for example, uh, beliefs that uh, using fans or air conditioning is bad for, for health. Uh, also, uh, the lack of information on uh, uh, how to best deal with, uh, with heat. So uh, individuals, were most of them were not aware of, uh, of the, the heat wave plan that existed. Um, moving on to financial assets. So, uh, many, many uh, older people were wor worried about high electricity prices if they were using cooling devices, and that was due to low income uh, and also uh, obviously due, due to that uh, cooling was not a priority for them as they had other pressing priorities as buying food or medication, for example. In terms of physical assets, some of them didn't uh, even own any cooling devices. And, Two minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, other aspects of um, of, uh, of extreme heat uh, adaptation were uh, social context. Individuals more um, uh, socially active were able to adapt better. 
When we look at extreme cold adaptation, similar uh, human assets and financial assets, as well as physical and place-based assets were found um, uh, in relation to, to cold, um, some, some issues related to uh, the fear of falls in, in older adults were uh, key aspects and also um, housing tenure uh, when uh, individuals were not able to, to change the way they, 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 they house uh, was because they, they, they were not uh, homeowners. But there were also opportunities uh, for uh, enhancing adaptation, uh, both to heat and and to cold. Uh, cold. And, that, and, and older adults uh, found that uh, uh, having long life education would be a, a good way of improving their ability to deal with heat and cold, uh, and also for them to become more aware of, um, of the dangers that they pose. And also measures in terms of housing and, uh, and uh, programs and uh, and policies uh, that uh, they would like to to see implemented in their local authorities uh, can can be seen in these uh, in these tables in terms of conclusions uh, we can say that uh, they they are very useful and uh, they allow us to understand that um, because of the unusual and unfrequent uh, um, uh, experience that older adults have uh, in relation to heat or cold, the way they deal with them is different. Uh, and uh, what we need to do is um, they, they, we need to uh, implement individualized and tailored uh, actions uh, to improve uh, their uh, adaptation. And local authorities could have a very important role to play uh, because they are trusted by individuals and uh, um, uh, in terms of research and also practice uh, it would be very very useful to to link research and uh, and local authorities so here are some references and thank you very much for your attention thank you so much and thank you so much for sticking exactly to your time that's really very helpful um, I just wanted to ask, um, how do you think is, is the key way that we can engage local authorities thinking about the previous presentations that we've seen as well? Yeah, thank you very, very much for your question, Elizabeth. It's, it's really uh, a very important uh, question and uh, obviously for many different types of, of subjects. But in, in this case, local authorities uh, in some cases are already doing quite a lot. Um, some of them are, are doing it through evidence-based uh, uh, research and, and, and through uh, research findings, and others are, are just leading on what they feel their um, uh, the, the local residents uh, need, but I think there, there needs to, to be a, a more um, coherent approach between uh, research and practice, and in this case, local authorities, so that um, the implementation of programs and, and actions is, is, is fair and equal for, for, for everyone, everywhere. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and just thinking, what what would you say personally is is the biggest challenge right now in this area? I think that the biggest challenge, both in the global north and and in the global south, is um, access to to assets. And um, realities are very different, but. The, the problems, the root problems are, are the same. So the lack of income, uh, the lack of an appropriate uh, housing, um, even social uh, networks, um, they play a, a huge role in, in the way that individuals are, are able to, to adapt to extreme heat and, and extreme cold. Um, so I think having a, an assets-based approach and looking individually at uh, uh, ca characterizing um, the different types of assets that individuals have, at both directly and also indirectly available uh, to, to them is, is essential. 
that's yeah totally agree thank you so much that was such a really interesting presentation thank you, thank you for your time um next we have uh jeffrey chan with fever of unknown origin and oral diseases a case report is jeffrey with us today hi yes i am here hi jeffrey brilliant are you able to share um, yeah, um yes i'm working on it um Okay, there you go. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. So um, I'll start. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jeffrey Chen. I'm really delighted to be here um, to present my work. Um, my topic today is feed of known origin and oral diseases, a case report. I have no disclosures. So first off, what is feed of unknown origin or FUO? It's known as, uh, it's defined as uh, body temperature over 38.3 degrees Celsius for over three weeks without any obvious cause, despite um, rigorous evaluations. So um, this picture, this illustration summarizes the cascade of events that can uh, lead to fever, um, uh, including infections, toxins, or other mediators of inflammation can cause fever. Um, despite being unknown at the time of clinical presentation, FUO are subject to um, some uh, attributions by uh, common etiologies, including infectious diseases, um, malignancies, and other non-infectious inflammatory causes as listed in this uh, picture. So my question is, can oral diseases also contribute to fever of unknown origin. Um, a little bit of background, oral diseases are the most common non-communicable diseases in the world. Poor oral health affects the general health by contributing to various systemic diseases. Um, I, I'll, I'll quote this WHO report, although a little bit old, but still very relevant. They survey for dental caries experience, um, of 12-year-old 12, 12 children across all WHO regions. Uh, they basically measure the decayed, missing, and filled teeth in those children. The more of these teeth, the uh, teeth, the worse dental carry experience they have. So um, across all WHO region, on average, um, each child has close to 2.5 of such teeth, which is not good. That shows how uh, prevalent a oral disease is. Um, even in adults, we have the community periodontal index, um, checking on adults' uh, gum health. The best score would be a perfect zero, not, not a four. A four corresponds to the worst score. So across all WHO regions, there are very few that can attain a perfect zero, a lot of two, threes, or even fours. Um, some more recent studies suggest Chronic periodontitis, that is the inflammation of the gum and the, and the connective tissues. Uh, it's related to some common systemic diseases such as heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, and so on, perhaps mediated by some pro-inflammatory cytokines. So we know from our knowledge, um, oral disease can potentially cause fever too. Um, however, they are often overlooked or ignored when we evaluate for FUO. So I want to illustrate uh, this important connection uh, by reporting a case of FUO complicated with oral diseases. So uh, um, my case is a 29-year-old female. I'm having fever up to 39.7 degrees Celsius, uh, lasting for a year on and off. Besides fever, she also had dizziness, right facial swelling, and sore throat. I want to particularly pay attention to her right facial swelling and sore throat because these will give us potential, potentially diagnostic clues. Um, her past medical history is also of interest because she had dental caries, wisdom tooth, both are oral conditions, which can also give us diagnostic clues. Her physical uh, examination um, was largely normal. There was normal uh, lymph nodes. Thyroid was normal. No roots, no rails uh, in, her, in her lungs. 
heart rate was steady, neurologically normal. So her physical examination doesn't give us any specific clues to her diagnosis. The lab tests, we were able to exclude some um, common fever inducing conditions, including tuberculosis, typhoid, hepatitis, thyroid disorders, and neoplasm. These are some of the findings. Most of them fall within the normal reference range. The slight shift in white blood cell count and also changes in calcitonin, but those are really insignificant and perhaps just reveal that she had um, chronic inflammation. We also did imaging, echocardiography, and chest CT to check her heart, her chest, her lungs to see if there's any uh, fever inducing conditions, including abscess, any active in infection or tumor. We found no such thing. Um, she complained because she complained of dizziness uh, at the beginning. Uh, so we also checked the blood flow from her neck to her head, which was normal. Um, electrocardiography was normal as well. So we do need further investigation to find out what was causing her fever. Recalling that she had uh, facial swelling, sore throat, dental caries, with some tooth eruption, these are all conditions in the oral cavity. So to solve the, the puzzle, uh, we asked the experts. We consulted uh, the ENT doctor and stomatologist. With, with their great help, we were able to diagnose the patient with pericoronitis and chronic tonsillitis. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, pericoronitis is the inflammation of the gum surrounding the crown of the tooth, and it's often connected to wisdom tooth eruption. So both of these diagnoses are conditions in the oral cavity caused by infection. As for treatment, we provided prophylactic antibodies as well as other symptomatic treatments for other conditions. And targeting her oral uh, conditions, we recommended a wisdom tooth extraction and tonsillectomy, to which the patient showed good response. So a summary of her clinical timeline, six years ago, she had wisdom tooth. A, a year ago, she started ha uh, to have fever. Half a year ago, dental caries. The dental caries suggesting that she had poor oral hygiene. Combining with her wisdom tooth history, uh, perhaps uh, they, they contribute to her pericoronitis and tonsillitis condition, which were our diagnoses and our treatment targeting those that help subside the fever. Uh, that perhaps suggesting that her fever is caused by poor oral condition. So uh, to discuss, um, half the world's population is estimated to be affected by oral diseases. And we know there's an association between oral and systemic diseases. Um, oral infection can cause systemic inflammation and our body responds uh, by inducing a fever to enhance uh, community to fight off thank you yeah fight, fight off the infection so um, with this logic in mind physicians often fail to consider or recognize um, oral disease as a potential culprit we know there are overlaps between FUO and other uh, and oral diseases and infections a study showed that up to 57 percent of FUO cases are due to infection and we know um, a, a a proportion of infections are also caused by oral diseases. Uh, I remind, remind you that 3.5 billion in the world are affected. So this is simply an elephant too big in the room to, to be ignored. So in conclusion, we discovered a connection between FEO and oral disease in our patient. We consider, uh, we suggest considering oral diseases as, as a potential cause when, when we face FEO cases. Um, as accurate diagnosis lead to more proper treatment and better prognosis. Uh, there are oral health disparities by race, ethnicity, age, education, putting certain groups higher risk in facing infection and, and fever. And this problem even worsened during the COVID pandemic. So we do encourage uh, healthcare um, providers to promote oral hygiene to everyone as a preventive measure. So um, just to quote the historian Thomas Fuller, health is not failure till sickness comes. And in our case, oral health 
it's not fairly to as your comes. Um, these are my acknowledgements. Um, thank you for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was so, so interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you something based on a presentation we saw yesterday and I was just wondering whether you had any plans to explore the links between oral disease and vaping. Oh, this is a vaping. That and, and vaping, um, yeah. Vaping, yes, great. Yeah, that, um, certainly, uh, I had not thought about this before, but I think it is something worth um, studying. Uh, vaping can, as far as I know, vaping can directly and directly affect many parts of the body, um, include uh, most directly in the oral cavity as well. So uh, certainly I, I would love to collaborate or to look into it. Um, That's great. Yeah, thank you so much. And we have another thank question. You so much. Um, sure. Do you have any recommendations for improving communication or links between dental professionals and medics to help recognize these issues sooner? Oh, yes. Um, there are, you know, it, it kind of it's depressing that how, how dentists or, or dental professionals and, and regular perhaps GP or other doctors are often work uh, uh, independently. Um, I think uh, every, every doctor, including GPs or other, other sort of um, specialists, should, first of all, um, recommend everyone, every patient of theirs to to see a, a dental professional at least once or twice a year. And um, I, for, for me, I'm promoting, uh, as well as encouraging my colleagues to attend um, cross-disciplinary uh, meetings and uh, make, use of, make good use of social media. That was uh, one, one big thing to promote uh, dental or oral health. Um, we can form not just professional groups, but um, form networks or to do uh, public announcements. Um, we do something fun to engage not just professional, but day-to-day uh, -day people uh, to, to remind them about important uh, dental health education or promotion. So those are all the ideas I have in mind to enhance the collaboration or, uh, or what, between professionals as well as to the general public. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, a really excellent presentation. Thank you so Thank much you for so your much. time. Um, for this next presentation, um, I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves because my colleague tells me there may not be everybody here uh, or we're missing some people. So this next presentation is uh, youth health and well-being in my local community and uh, whichever speakers are presenting I will let them introduce themselves. Thank you. All right. Um, good afternoon everyone. I don't know, can you, can you hear me? Yes we can. Sorry, could you? Oh there we go. Brilliant. Thank you. All right. All right, thank you very much. Um, all right, my name is Asugun uh, Daniel. I'm a medical student in Ambassador University here in Nigeria. So we carried out a photo essay project together with, um, I carried out a photo essay project together with some of my colleagues in conjunction with Precious Gems Charity in the UK and the Christian Medical and Dental Association. So you can see our names on this slide. Akane J. Swobu, Iriori Zedbe, Zomal Vitri, Ogobagase, and Vivian, Asobun Joyce and Okihan Ive, so they are all present. So I'll just pick up, pick start the presentation. All right, so the locations that um, we focused on are Ira, Ekoma, and Ira, and Uromi in Edo State, Nigeria. So if you look at the map, you can easily make it out. And these areas have a combined population of about 400,000 people. So that was our target population that will focus on the areas. And um, 
as you know, Nigeria is one of the most, if not the most populated country in Africa. So our local community should not be surprised that it has such a large population. The theme was factors influencing youth health and well-being in Ekpoma and Zewa in this state Nigeria. So that was the focus of the photo essay. All right, so we divided this photo essay into four aspects. So I'll be taking the first one. The biggest influence on youth health and well-being. All right, so I'll be kickstarting with poverty. Now, as you can see from the photograph, um, this was taken during a village outreach held in 2019 by the CMD. So many kids come from families that live on less than the minimum wage here in Nigeria, and reduced financial power affects their health and well being. According to the Harmonized Nigeria Living Standards Survey, it said that 70.3% of Nigeria children live in extreme po live in poverty, while 23.2% live in extreme poverty. Sorry about that. So that just gives you a picture of what many of the children in rural communities actually face because of um, reduced financial power. So I'll be handing over to my colleague to continue from there. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Okina Ibe. This is a picture showing a young boy hawking for stuff to raise money to meet family needs. Poverty is driving a rise in the number of Nigeria child hawkers in Nigeria. It's a very common sight in our streets, especially in this rural area, um, Ekoman era. The increase is as a result of sparing poverty and the worsening economic situation of the country. According to the International Labour Organization, it estimates that in Nigeria, about 14 million children between the ages of 5 and 14 are involved in a form of economic activity such as hawking. This street hawking has a lot of implications on their physical and emotional well-being such as they are, they are exposed to sexual abuse, malnutrition, drug and substance abuse, prostitution, physical uh, exhortation, vehicle accidents, which can also lead to their deaths. So my colleague, Izek, they will continue to talk about the key challenges. Thank you. I'm Izek here, and I'll be talking about the key challenges affecting the well-being and health of youth in my local community. Next slide, please. As we can see in this picture, poor family planning coupled with poor living condition is a major challenge that affects the health of youths in my community. The inavailability of good jobs for parents reduces the quality of health care assessed by many children. Parents don't have good jobs, hence they can't provide the basic needs of these children, which includes health care, proper health care. Next slide, please. Various cultural religion, uh, religious and educational effects play a role in the well-being of children in the sense that there are certain beliefs that affect their access to health care because informal and formal education is a, is a major challenge because many people in this environment don't have access to such education. So they don't know that they are supposed to access health care and it's the best for them. Next slide, please. If we look closely at this picture, this is a refuse dump site situated very close to a primary school. If you look closely, there are children in the primary school field who are playing. The environment in which these children find themselves is also a major challenge in the sense that it increases their susceptibility to many diseases which are already endemic in this region. My colleague Joyce will talk about other challenges facing youth health and well-being in our community. Okay, as I thank you very much. My name is Asugun Joyce. Um, I'll be talking about key challenges also. As you can see in this picture, this is a residential area of people looking down very well. See some people wearing white, they are children. You can see stagnant water at the back. It serves as a breeding ground for malaria. Stagnant water in many areas contributes to high malaria incidence in already endemic area. Research shows that 121 children die of malaria every four months in Nigeria. Research also shows that malaria infections coupled with risk factors affect coupled with risk factors related to poverty impair adolescent health and youth development in Nigeria. Next slide, please. 
Um, as you can see in this place, this is a, this is a primary healthcare center, but it has the window blinds are missing. Many youths in Nigeria, they, when they fall sick, they tend to go here, but when they get there, no facility, nothing to take care of them, no doctors or nurses on ground to take care of them. And there's no adolescent center health clinics for these diseases. Next slide, please. Okay, this is also the primary health care center showing how, how um, poorly developed and everything. Please, my colleague, continue and talk about the signs of hope. Hello, can you hear me? Um, I'm just Hello, can you hear me? Um, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm going to talk about the signs of hope. I'm so Our sorry. So sorry. We've got a bit of feedback coming through. Uh, your, your, your voice is coming through sort of on a loop twice. Can you hear me now? We, we can hear you, but it, it's coming through yeah. on okay. a loop. My... Oh, that's better. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, the signs of hope. What are the signs of hope after all these challenges that have been seen and pointed out by my colleagues? Um, it's been said that um, hope is the light seen even in the darkest hour. What are the signs of hope? The signs of hope here is depending on the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations that are around in this vicinity, of which um, Precious James, um, a, a group called Touching Life at Christmas, and also the Christian Medical and Dental Association students, um, which I belong, usually engage in activities whereby we go and um, admonish the children and the youths on their health and also perform um, a lot of um, medical outreach and health awareness. Next slide, please. And also, we also visit them in the orphanages. We try to reach them where we know they can be, their target population, orphanages, schools, and we do that to promote their mental and social well-being because we've come to understand that um, good health or optimum health is not just the absence of disease, but a balanced and optimal social, mental, and physical well-being. I'll be handing over to my colleague, um, Victory, to take over. All right, sorry, I, I think my colleague Richie is having uh, challenges. Yeah, she's yeah. having network challenges, so I'll just take this aspect oh, for her. Oh, um, thank you. All right, so health awareness campaigns. This, this, this next picture is showing a health awareness campaign that was conducted by some medical students here in Ekoma. I went to teach this some of the children about um, things surrounding their health and well-being. So you can see them smiling because it's not every day they get a group of medical students coming to talk to them. And um, the next um, the next slide talks, you can also see these are another set of medical students that went to a school. After talking to them about their health and well-being well -being as well, we gave them gifts, books, and just made them feel at least connected with us. And I'm sure many of them carried a lot in that meeting. Why this one was that we had a pediatric outreach within the hospital, the rural specialist teaching hospital. We went to see kids during the Christmas season, and you can see one of us there, that's Jane, she's smiling. We brought um, a, a guy in costume to also come and put smiles on the children. And you can see a quote from Dai Lama there saying, a simple smile, that's the start of opening your heart and being compassionate to others. All right, so I'll be handing over to my next colleague who will be talking about the architectural and urban features that promote youth health and well being. Vivian, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Good day, everyone. I'm Vivian Orbagase, and I'll be talking on the architectural and urban infrastructure in my community that improve youth health and well-being. In my community, we have quite a few. We have the university, which is a place for learning. Youth from my community and outside my community come to learn. We also have hospitals and health centers. These are places for diagnosis, control, management of medical and surgical health conditions in the youth. We also have social event centers, gaming centers, restaurants and more, where youth come to socialize. It also provides employment on part-time and full-time basis. And as seen here, we have facilities for sporting and exercises. 
This helps improve youth health by providing platform for activities that improve endurance and help them cope with stress. It also, activities, uh, um, sports activities and exercises like we know, help with the general well-being. Also, it nurtures talents to maturity, helps them train to become sports professionals. It prevents them from idling away and getting involved in unhealthy social practices like drug and alcohol abuse and um, unhealthy um, sexual um, practices. By engaging in sporting activities and exercises, they form, they form groups, they learn teamwork, they learn to communicate. It also teaches them the, the importance of hard work and dedication, which is not taught in schools and is not preached nowadays since the handwriting on the wall is get it fast and get it quick. It also gives them this sense of oneness of belonging to something very important and it helps build their confidence. Next slide, please. Two minutes. Next slide, please. In conclusion, I will say my colleagues and I have gone over the stories about our community. It's a huge story and what we've said is just a part of it. A huge part lies in, the, in our hearts and in the hearts of well-meaning individuals like CMDA and the Precious Gen. And these individuals all work together to bring about growth and development. And we, go, we do this taking one step at a time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that really, really excellent presentation and I, I, I'm really pleased to see the last slide as well. I think sometimes as researchers we're afraid to say what's close to our hearts and I think that's really, really um, good of you to say that. I, I, I wanted to ask a question before um, I read out Greg's and that was a, particularly about the Touching Lives work, which is just amazing. Um, do you plan to continue with that? And do you see any challenges in sustaining it? Okay, all right. Um, thank you very much. Um, currently, that um, Touching Lives as Christmas um, initiative is something that is held every year. Um, as, as per sustainability, we partner with a number of NGOs here. So many of these NGOs, they are very willing to like, provide the funds and things that help to sustain the program itself. So for now, yes, in the long term, I see it still going on for the next couple of years. And um, if there's going to, if there are going to be any issues that are going to prevent it from holding, I'm sure we are going to be able to reach out to other people who will be able to assist maybe in the financial aspect. Because the major problem with organizing such things are the finances. But for now, we are still very much covered. That's really great to hear. Thank you. Um, Greg asks, um, are you already noticing some of the benefits of the health awareness campaigns in the young people? And if so, can you provide any examples, please? Okay, I think, I don't know if any of my colleagues would be willing to answer that particular question. So I'll give them an opportunity. All right. Many of these campaigns, we see that when we go to rural environments, to educate them about things they were not aware before, aware of before. They're usually very enlightened and they always welcome us. They are usually very welcoming. And the, you see these people that, the, you see that these people are hungry for knowledge and they really want to know more, know more that can benefit their health, know more about what they can use, what information they can use to make their children's health better. So they're usually very receptive and the campaigns are usually effective to an extent. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a really, truly present, uh, excellent presentation. And I think uh, that draws us to an end uh, for this session. And I just want to reiterate what a great session it's been and, and what a brilliant bunch of presentations and speakers. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, please okay. don't forget to vote for your favorite presentation at the link in the chat. And I just wanted to ask as well, if it's okay with everybody, we would like to share some snippets from today's presentations on Twitter. And if you wouldn't like us to do that, please do let us know. Um, and we'll draw it to a conclusion there. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time.